Okay. So in today's lecture, I want to continue our conversation. I want to continue covering the concepts that relate to arrays. Uh, here, I want to move on to talk more about arrays and how they relate with reference types. So I know we've mentioned this previously, but let's be very explicit with some of these concepts. So recall, let's talk about what reference data types are. So we spent a lot of time earlier in the semester talking about primitive data types. And one of the things that really defines a primitive data type is the fact that all of the values within a primitive data type are known, they're encoded as literal values inside of Java. So they don't consume any memory. It's part of the Java installation that contains all those values. The things that define a reference data type is that it doesn't have a literal value defined within Java itself, so when we, when we assign a value to something that's a reference data type, it's stored in memory. And so we have a memory address that we go and look up to get that value, to get access to that value. So again, when I have the value of three, that's a primitive value, Java has that encoded, right? It doesn't have to decipher that. Whereas a string, we said strings are reference data types. That's why we use the capital uppercase S with it. And the reason why that has to be a reference data type is because the number of permutations that string has, there's no way to actually encode that, to hard code that into Java. So every time we create a string, it's a unique thing that we then store in memory and we just retrieve it whenever we need it. So we learned that process of storing things into memory, that is what a variable is. We learned that there's a special type of variable, an array variable, that allows us to store more than one value into memory. And because of that, arrays in themselves are kind of like this advanced data type that consumes memory address uh, or, or memory space. And so it's going to have the initial pointer in memory to where the array is stored at. But then we also said that the indexer value is the number of offsets of additional values that we can hold in that contiguous block of memory. So a memory address versus a primitive value is gonna be very important when we start talking about how we can share a value of our array variable as opposed to a primitive data type. And again, we talked about the array indexer variables. A couple of terms I want to just highlight when I start communicating about the, the, the uh, code, because I don't know if I've um, formally uh, gave definitions to these or not. We can use the term reference and dereference. So the term reference refers to the fact that I have a value and I have a variable name, that variable name is an alias. So when we see something that's human readable, what it translates into the computer side of things is a hexadecimal number, which is the addressable space in memory that we're looking to access. So when we access that location and pull that value out, that's what's called dereferencing. So when I say dereference a value, that means I'm looking up where it's stored in memory and I'm getting back the actual value that's stored there. So if you hear me use the word dereference, that's what I intend to mean by it. And when I ever say reference or like a reference data type, I'm referring to the fact that there is a reference that we're using so that the value we're looking at isn't the actual value. It's something that is used to uh, look up in our, our memory to get the actual value. So the value is stored in memory and I can re it, and I can reference that value by just dereferencing it using the variable name that we've assigned to it. Okay, so the big thing here that I wanna cover is this idea of passing by value versus passes, passing by reference. So when we first learned about methods, what we were really doing was passing by value. So passing by value means that we can give that literal value in the parameter. And so that value is then shared to another method 
that can mutate that value however it wants, and it doesn't change the original variable that passed by value. Where passed by reference means that we can give the actual memory address to where the, the uh, data type is in memory, and anything that changes using the reference, anything that changes that object, that, uh, that data type, that, that value of that data type, uh, using the memory address, it will change for every other method that also has access to that value. So let's see what that actually means. So, okay, so what we're gonna do here is we're gonna show how to pass an array into a method. We're gonna show the difference by, uh, between the pass by value and the pass by reference concept. Here, primitive values and string values are passed by values to, uh, to other methods, which means that if we use an, uh, a variable as an argument, so arrays don't have a singular value. The memory address of the array is passed to other methods so that they can read right into it. This is called pass by reference. This may be dangerous as now the array is shared across methods and change within one method will cause it to change for all other methods. So let's take a look at this source code and we're gonna break it down and we're gonna make sure that we all kind of understand what's going on here. So this is gonna be called pass array. So let's go here, touch. Okay. So let's uh, let's let's start with this. Let's start by eliminating some code. So let's get rid of. Uh, let's start with just the print array. So let's get rid of all this, and then I'll go back and get this stuff as we need it. So I'm going to create a class called Pass Array. I'm going to create a main method. And so on my main method, I'm going to use a array initializer list here, or an array literal, to create a int array that has the value 73, 87, 57, 102. And then I'm gonna take this array literal and I'm going to store that into memory under the alias, under the identifier of int array. And then what I'm going to do is I'm gonna create a helper method. So another method defined inside the class scope of my pass array. It's gonna take in a parameter here of an integer array, an array of ints. And so this, remember, is going to declare a local variable called array, which only exists inside the block of code that's assigned inside this method. Then what I'm going to do here is I'm going to create a string called R string. I'm going to assign it a initial string, which is just like a open curly brace. Then I'm going to create an enhanced for loop where I'm going to iterate over each of the values inside of the array. And this array was passed to us right by the invoking method. So what I'm going to do then is I'm gonna take each value that was passed in and I'm gonna concatenate this. So notice I'm gonna use this compound assignment operator where I have a string and I'm gonna to add to that string, the current string, the new value of this number. So it's gonna convert that number from an integer into a string. And then it's gonna add an empty uh, space after it. So after we do that for every integer value inside of our array, I will then go ahead and concatenate a closing curly brace. So this is going to effectively create a string that when we pass an array into it, it's gonna make it print out such that it looks like a literal array, right? And then I'll just do a system.out.print on that. And since I'm doing the print to console here, there's no reason to return this back to the invoking method. So here, so this would be a procedure method. So here I'm going to use the return type of void because we're just doing a, we're just executing a block of statements. Excellent. So does anyone have any questions about what's happening with this method here? Or is this clear enough? Okay, so then what I'm going to do is now that I have this helper method, I'm then going to invoke it inside my main method. So I'm gonna call on print array and inside print array, I'm gonna pass it that integer array. And that integer array is a reference data type. So when I pass that array, I'm actually getting to this method print array, the memory address to where all these values are stored. I'm not giving it like, what is that? One, two, three, four, five. I'm not giving it five different values all at once. 
I'm just giving it the address. So let's see what happens here. Let me blow this up some. So what this is called the pass array. So let's compile that and then let's run that. So here we get a, a printout into our console that has the open curly brace, then it iterates over each of the numbers, 73, then it adds a space, 87, then adds a space, 57, then adds a space, 100, then adds a space, two, then adds a space. After we're done that enhanced for loop, it adds that closing brace. And finally, after building that string, it prints it out. So this is exactly what we'd expect it to have. Okay, let's add to that though, because so the first thing we're going to do now is let's add this method call here. Let's change an element inside of this array. So we're going to make this one call here. Now let's grab that method and let's talk about what's going to happen with this method. So let me grab this method. Let's add this into our source code. I'm going to add it up here. And so this is the method that I'm about to do a dissection on. So again, this is going to be a public static void. It means we're not going to return anything. It's just going to be a block of statements that execute, but don't provide back any values. We'll call this change array. And the parameters that's going to require is going to be a integer array. So we're going to pass in our array. So here, I'm going to go ahead and then use a classical, a traditional for loop. So I'm going to create an index. Uh, variable called i. I'm going to start it at zero because zero is the first place that we can index into. Then I'm going to go ahead and so long as i is less than the length of my array, so I want to index into every possible value for it, I will go ahead and increment it. So inside of the body of my for loop, I'm going to use the box notation to dereference the value in my array that's at location i. So the first element in my, or let's call it the zeroth element of my array is at location zero. And the first element would be at location one. And the second would be in location two. I'd do all the way until I get to location four. And then I'm going to use a compound assignment to multiply whatever the current value is by 10. Okay, and then, then what I'm going to do after I change the element is let's do this. Let's um. I'm going to also print the array. Oh, wait. This is change array. Oh, well, so let's we'll just update it. There we go. So change array. So I'm going, what I'm going to do is I'm going to print the array. Then I'm going to change the array. And then I'm going to print the array, the, the state of the array, after I do that. So what would you expect to happen on, on line four when we invoke print array? What should be the output? 730, 570, 570, uh, et cetera. Well, that would be on line six, right? So after we call change array, oh. everything will be changed though. That, that's the key ID though, right? So when we do it the first call here to print array, it'll be 73, 87, 57, 102, but you're right. At the second call in line six, everything should be multiplied by 10. So we would expect it to be 730, 870, 570, uh, 1,020, right? Does, does everyone agree that that's what we should expect? Okay, so let's take a look at this. And let's actually test that. And here we go. We see on the first printout before we invoke change array, it is, in fact, what it originally was declared and initialized as. And then after invoking that method, this is the invocation on, uh, on print array on line six, we see everything has been multiplied by 10. But notice, notice that the values then in the array have actually been updated, right? That Because we passed the array by reference, we gave the reference in memory to the other methods. When we, when we pass it along. So any changes that happened in this method, notice got reflected inside of not only the main method, but inside of print array. Anything that's using this array that we're passing array around will now have to deal with those changes. Now that's good in some ways, but can you see how that could potentially be negative as well? 
if you if you didn't un, if you didn't realize that a method was changing the state of your array, then that could be really bad, right? Okay, let's take a look at passing by value though. So that's passing by reference. Let's actually go to change element, which is what I originally wanted to look at first, so we can compare and contrast. So here I'm going to invoke a change element method, which we haven't defined yet. So let me go ahead and copy that here. And I'm gonna put it up here at the top so that we can examine it. So this is gonna be the new method we're gonna look at. It's also gonna be a public static void method. So it's not gonna return anything. It's gonna be called change element because the idea is we don't wanna change the entire array. We just wanna change a singular, singular element from the array. So notice since we're not gonna pass the array into the parameter space, it's gonna be a singular integer value. Here, what we'll do is we'll print out the initial value that got passed in. So that'll be whatever the element was. And we will just go ahead and then set that element to be zero. Okay, and then here what we'll do is after we call a change element, we're gonna print the array. So again, we're not returning anything, we're just executing this block of code. What do you anticipate on line eight now? So we know what happens on line four and six. We've already tested that. What will happen when I go and call print array on line eight. Let's take a look first at what the parameter that was passed in. So since I'm passing in a singular integer value, I'm not passing in a full array. Since I'm passing a singular integer value, I'm going to dereference from my int array, let's say the value at position zero. And I'm gonna pass that as the int value that goes here. And then I'll execute this block where I print it out and then set that element to zero. So after doing that block of code that's assigned to this method, what's going to be the final printout on line eight when we send this to our print array method? What do you think it is? So first of all, what value is the one that's being sent to change element out of my array? So I have, so if this is the array here, which element are we, is the one of interest? Yeah, it's going to be it's going to be the first one, right? Because we we're dereferencing index zero that we're passing to change element. So the one that's actually getting passed into this method is going to be the value that is seven hundred thirty, right? Which means that we're not passing any other values because remember this this method here is taking in a singular int value. It's not taking in a uh, array, which means that we're going to be passing by value. We're not passing by reference. We only pass by reference when we send the entire array. When we send this individual primitive value, we're passing by value. So with that said, what do you think is gonna happen? Is, is it still gonna be 730 or is it gonna be zero? What do you think? Zero. zero. How many other people think zero? Okay, what about uh, 730? Who thinks it will remain unchanged? So it's about a equal split. Let's let's check it out. Let's save and let's run and uh, let's actually save my changes to the source code. Let's so that we can actually run that. Okay, here we go. So here I have the original array. Here I have the effects of the array after we invoke change array which uses pass by reference. Here is the system.out inside of the method change element where we say, oh, I, I've gotten this element's value of 730. I'm changing that local variable to zero. But now if I print out the array after that method call, notice it remains unchanged. And it's because we didn't pass the memory address, we passed the individual value so anything that happens inside here is affecting just the value that was passed in. It doesn't have access to the array to mutate it. So this is a very nuanced thing that can cause some erroneous behavior if you don't realize what's happening here. So do you see, does everyone see why now this remains 730 and doesn't become zero? 
It's because this element here that we're setting to zero in line 15 isn't tethered to the values that are held inside the memory that represents our array. We extracted that value here, and then that value is then assigned to the local variable of int element. But once it's been assigned that value, it no longer has a link to the array. So if we mutate that value, the only thing we mutate is the local variable, which is some other location in memory that is separate from the location in memory that our array is being held at. Is that, that so? So so if I was to like try to draw this out, let me make a uh, comment here. So if I was to try to draw this out, imagine that these are my addressable spaces. So for argument's sake, let's use like letters to create addressable spaces. So I have like let's say A A represents the first value in my array. So let's say this is the starting point in my array. So this is where I hold my value of seventy three. And here I'll I'll make a pointer. So at at and then a, B would then hold that next value, 87. And then let's say A, C would hold that next value, let's say 57. Then let's say A, D would hold this other value, let's say 100. And then A, E would hold this other value that's in it. So when we declare our array that holds, what, five elements, one, two, three, four, five, what's happening is it gets A, initial assignable block of memory where it stores the first value. And then it also assigns, it, it, it gets all those memory addresses allocated at once. So the second is gonna be in the next assignable block that's, that uh, is allowed. So that would be 87 and 57. So that's why we have the index of one, the index of zero. I'll put this off to the side because that's an offset from the original memory address that allows us to gain access to the value we want. Okay, and then finally, okay. So what happens though, is when we dereference, let me try to line this up. Okay, so when we dereference in line seven here, what we're doing is we're accessing this value. Well, this value after when we were doing that, everything was multiplied by, okay. So we're accessing this value here and we're passing the value, not the memory address. So it's like we're copying this and we're putting that there. That's what Java is doing for us, putting that actual numerical value there. Well, that is a literal value. That is a primitive data type value. So it's passed by value here. So when we go to invoke this method, since they have a parameter that uses a primitive variable, this is creating a local space of memory. So let's say that this new memory address is BA. And inside this, which it is we give the name element. So that when, we, when we mention element, element and BA, are effectively the same thing. It's an alias. And what's held there would now be the value of 730. And every time we make a change to this value, it actually affects the memory address at BA. So when we set that to zero, this is the thing that changes, whereas this all remains the same. Did like this illustration help at all? Kind of, or did this just confuse people more? The, so that's, that is a representation of the offset from the original space and memory that we're storing all of our values at. So again, the way that an array declaration works is, versus the way that a normal variable declaration works is uh, a variable declar a declaration represents a space in memory. So when we say, I want to hold an integer and I want to call that integer X then we create an alias, we create an identifier in our code where we can use the human readable name of X, but what X really represents is this numerical, this hexadecimal numerical uh, memory address that is the actual memory location of where the value of X is being stored at. Now, an array is very special in the fact that it not only can hold one value, but it can hold multiple values. But all those values are in the same block of memory. So what that means is that if I want to store 
four values in an array, I have to declare that I have an array of size four, of length four. And what happens is the first indexable value that normally gets assigned to the variable is where the initial value, the value at index zero is at. But then if I index one, the, the next space after that int is where the second value is at. And then the next space after that value is where the third uh, value is. And then finally, after that is the fourth value. So here, I'm just representing that the memory address here is incremented by one. So 870 literally follows 730, like, like not just in my explanation to you, but physically held in memory, the, all those values are grouped together. Whereas when I try to illustrate, we're gonna go to some other location in memory, when we invoke this function, it could be any random memory address. It's not, it's not part of the array's memory address though. D does that answer your question? So all of this is a contiguous block and that's why we use the index values because it, it tells us how many spaces to jump in memory to access the value we want. But because of that, because all the values are grouped by memory, there's no way for us to share this as a literal thing. So when we go to share with other methods, we share it by giving the memory address of the array. And then if we make changes to anything in memory, well, it affects everything else. We saw that. But when we dereference a value, where we just pull the individual value and then pass that into this method here, we're not given the memory address of array at index zero, we're dereferencing it. So we're going into the memory, we're getting the value that's held to that memory, and we're providing that method the value, not the memory location. And so what happens then is that value is then shared inside of this parameter space where we're creating a local variable that's called element that holds a data type int, and here, what I was trying to highlight here is that's some other different location in memory. And then when we invoke that value, we're providing it the value of 730, right? We're not giving it the memory location to our array. We're actually giving it the primitive value that was held in that array. So that's going to create another storage operation that's called element that now has the value of 730. But if we mutate the value held at that memory address. So again, on line 25 here, we mutated that to zero. So in this part of memory, it goes to zero. We'll notice that doesn't change what's happening in the original array space. Inside the original memory, that's holding all of the values in our array. So when we're done processing this method, even though we ch change this local value to zero, it doesn't change it here so that when we do our final printout, it remains the same. And so really that's the difference between being able to pass data by the value versus passing data by its memory address, by its reference. Whenever I say reference, I mean its location in memory. Did that help clear up the question? Okay. Okay, anyone online who has any uh, questions related to these concepts? Okay, so this, so this idea though, that a memory address name is a reference to, I'm, I'm sorry, that a array's name is a reference to its location in memory and the, it's a continuous block of codes is now gonna motivate the next thing we can do with arrays. So we learned that arrays are super powerful, that regardless of the data type, whether it's primitive or whether it's a reference data type like strings, we can create an array of it. So here's my next thing. Do you think it's possible for us to create an array that can hold other arrays? And so the answer is yes. We can create an array of arrays, or we can create what are called multidimensional arrays. So there's another uh, a number of names we can call these: multidimensional arrays, array of arrays, or nested arrays. 
So a, a multi, we'll also take a look at uh, multidimensional array literals or initializers versus the, the standard array literal. And we'll also look at how to create new empty multidimensional arrays. So let's take a look at this. So the idea behind a multidimensional array, and so this particular example code that we're looking at here is using the, um, is using the uh, initializer list. So remember with a singular initializer list, this would be an array. So in a array of arrays, we can have one array, we can have two arrays, we can have three arrays. So this is a way that we can initialize an array of an array. So the idea here is that we have the outer array here. So this is gonna be a string array of arrays, or I guess that you could think of it like this. Let me, so here, okay, so let's think of it like this. So we know that single box notation when applied to a variable says, okay, we can hold the values of strings, but by putting this box notation, it means we can hold more than one value of strings. So that's gonna create a string array. When these two things are combined, if I put another set of box notations after that, here I'm gonna create an array that can hold a collection of string arrays. So what's happening in memory, here is I can then create this outer array that can hold these individual smaller arrays. And then if we were to print these up, we could see that we can have the array that holds uh, Ted, Alex, Joe, this array that holds Mark, Joe, Lily, Tim, this array that holds Mike and Ed. And then we can go through, and if we wanna print those values out, we not only have to iterate in for the each element in the outer array, but then we also have to iterate over each element in the nested array or the inner array. Let's see, let's see if the other one's a little bit e easier to read. So we can go back to this one. Um, I think they're about equal in kind of con concepts that are uh, that hit our complexity. So let's go here. Let's let's test this out. So let's do our multi dim array, and let's test this out. So here, go here. Okay. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to create a class multi dim. I'm going to create a main method. Here, I'm going to declare and initialize a multidimensional array. So let's, let's start by doing this first. Let's convert this into a, a standard array. And then we'll, we'll, we'll expand this. So recall with a... Let's actually get that all onto one line. Okay, so for a standard array, this was the array literal. And then here, let's go ahead and comment this out. Let's comment this out. Okay, perfect. Let's run this and then we're gonna add the complexity in. Okay, what's, oh, there's no J. Save that. Nope. Okay, let's see here. What does it not like? Oh, um, whoops. Got to remove that too. And yeah, that looks good. Okay, once we get this to run, we'll go through and walk through it very precisely. Okay, so that actually runs. So let's take a look at this sample code, and then we're going to add to it so that it can actually be multidimensional. So here, this is a misnomer now. We're creating a standard string array called names, and we're going to assign into our name string array a string literal. So remember, that's a group of values 
that can represent the values of an array. So here it's a comma separated list. So the first value is going to be Ted. The next one will be Alex. The next one will be Joe. And so I will store these values in memory. Then I'm going to create a for loop that's going to use as my index value of zero. And for the so long as my index value is less than the length of my array, I will increment my indexer. And all I'm going to do here, this is all right here. This is all common at out. So I'm not doing this right here. I can actually remove that for now. So then what I'm going to do is I'm going to print out system.out.print uh, the array names, and I'm going to put in the index number that I'm currently using, and then I'm going to show the value. I'm going to do a dereference here at that index to show the value that's held there. So my output, and let me clear out all this so that I, when I run this, we can see this going to be at names index zero, it's Ted. At names index one, it's Alex. And at names index two, it's Joe. So up to this point, does anyone have any questions before I add complexity to this? Everyone's good with this. Okay, so I can actually, instead of making names a array of strings by adding another set of box notations in the declaration, it is now an array that holds string arrays. It's an array of array of strings. Or another way is we call it a 2D array of strings. So now that I'm now, now if I look on the other side of this assignment, now that I've said that this can hold an array of array of strings, this is now not valid. I, I now have one singular array, which means that the values I'm trying to store are strings, but the values I should try to be storing inside of my array of string arrays is arrays. Let me see if it lets me do this. Let me see if I can go ahead and do double parentheses. Let's, uh, let's comment that out. And let us just comment out this right here, the system that out. Let's, let's slowly grow this out. So it allowed me to compile. This doesn't do anything. Uh, let's actually do the printout here, but and let's modify this printout a little bit. So what do I want to print out here? Uh, yeah, let's, let's see what happens when I, when I keep this as is. Uh, let me recompile. Okay, here we go. So now what happens the moment I did that, and let me let me show what happens if I don't include these double quotations. Let's motivate some things. So that works. And when I do this, I get an error. So did everyone see the small change I made? Why do I need the double curly braces as opposed to the single curly braces? Why will this code not work with the single curly braces? Yeah, so this is saying, the type of data that names should hold is a collection. It's multiple string arrays. If I have the single curly braces, then the first value I'm giving is a string, not a string array, right? And so that's invalid because the type of data it's expecting isn't a string. It's an array that holds strings. So think about what that actually means. It means it's looking for a memory address that will then jump to some set of string values. Whereas this is an actual string value. So it's not the same type of data. But the moment I put a double curly brace, another way I can express that, and maybe an easier way of me expressing that is let me put some, uh, let me use some spacing. I love formatting things. This is what we're actually assigning. So. An array of an array requires an array that holds an array that is holding strings. Does everyone see that's what that is? So since I have two sets of brackets here, if I use a literal, I need to have a collection of array literals inside an array literal. And I can do this. We'll talk about that later. OK, so then when I do my printout, and let me save this. Let me clear this. Let's recompile. 
let's rerun this. Okay, so now let's look at this printout. Names zero at index zero is assigned. And then what do you think is happening here? Does everyone see what that output is? Do I need to blow that up some? What do you think that, that's kind of weird, right? So what we see here is that we're getting java.lang.string at, and so this is the memory address. So whenever you see these things reported, it's saying, oh, I have this like complex object. I have this array object that holds string. So this is a way of Java reporting that this is a string array at this memory address, which is way different than just the, than just the actual uh, name values. In fact, if I want to access these name values, for each of these boxes that I have, I need to have an index value. So when I'm going through um, for int zero equals, I mean, for uh, i equals zero here and to the length of this array, well, let me ask you this. What is the length of my outer array here? Yeah, it's one. There's only one element in it, right? What is the length of the inner array contained within it? three, right? So the array held within the array of arrays has three string values, but there's only one array of strings inside of my 2D array or my array of array of strings. Okay, perfect. So, and we can actually kind of uh, test this out here. We can... Let's actually add a system dot out dot print f where we put percent d new line character and uh, semicolon and let's just do names dot one. Okay, let's save that. Uh, names, plural. Okay, save that and rerun that. And we should see, yeah. So length of array is one here. And then we get the array uh, memory value. Yeah. Okay, so suppose that I don't want to see the memory location. Suppose that I actually wanted to see the actual values that were held inside that array of strings. Then I not only want to index, so notice this first indexer that I'm doing, so names i, what that's pulling for me is the inner array of strings. But then once I have access to that, I can use a second index value to walk across each of the values inside of that nested array. So let's take a look at that. Let's do four. And let's give this, we got to give it a different name. Let's use J. So I represents the index of the outer array. J will represent the index into my inner array that I'm accessing currently. So let's start J at index zero. And then let's say so long as J is less than the inside of names, I'm going to index in using I, and at that location is another array, isn't there? So that means that that array itself has a length. I'm going to go ahead and increment. Okay, here. Does everyone understand what's happening with this for loop? So I'm going to create a new index value to be able to track the position inside of each inner array. Right now, there's only one. And I can actually go and access the length of that inner array by using the external indexer i to get a reference of in memory to that array and then ask it, hey, other array, what is your length? Which is gonna be different than the outer array, right? We said the inner array was length three, the outer array was length one. And then we'll go ahead and gain that value. Uh, we'll increment and walk across that space. So let's look at the length of that array. 
here. So that we can actually see what it is. And then let's see if we can actually get the name. So to get the name, let's do system.out.printf. We're going to index using the outer indexer, which gives us access to the inner array. Then we're actually going to index into the second index value inside the inner uh, inside the inner array. So this is the outer, this is the inner. And then this will be the actual string value that we want. So here I will index at names ij. So for each box that we've declared, we can put an index value in there that will eventually resolve to us a string value. Let's actually print out the values of ij2 as well. Okay, so let me take this, let me clear my terminal. Let's compile this. And so here, let's see what's happening. My outer array has a length of one. Oh, let me do this too. Let me clean up my output a little bit. Let me pull out the for loop and put that there. Okay, here we go. So the length of my outer array is one. At names index zero is my array of strings. So using the length that's held at that memory location, I could find out that that array has three elements. At index zero, so on the array that's held at the zeroth position, at index zero inside of that array is the value Ted. At index zero in the outer array, and at index one inside of that first inner array is the value Alex. And at array zero on the outer array and on the array index of two is Joe. So here, I've actually been able to use enough indexing values to get from the array of array of strings to the array of string to the actual string value. So why don't we try doing this? Let's create more than one array to see how this works out then. And one of the interesting things to know about this approach is that we can create a multidimensional array that can be referred to as jagged. And what I mean by that is, is anyone familiar with the term uh, tabular data? So there's a rule for tabular data. Is that, so has anyone worked with a, um, like a spreadsheet software like Excel or Google Sheets? Or is everyone at least familiar with the concept of Excel? So yeah, so with Excel, you have rows and columns and the rows can be given names, the columns can be given names and inside of each of those is a cell. So one rule about tabular data, and we call that table data or tabular data. So Excel spreadsheets all follow the rules of tabular data, which means that the number of rows and the number of columns are always the same. So each row has the same number of columns. Each column has the same number of rows. Does that, does that make sense? So with an array of arrays, we can, we can model tabular data with a 2D array, but we also aren't confined by that definition of tabular data. We can create what's called a jagged array, which means that our first array, if we were to express it in terms of rows and columns, would say it has three columns of data, right? Ted, Alex, and Joe. Whereas our second array, so it's almost like this row could have two columns, Elsa and Tim, and then finally, this last array can have a single element. So that's like having one column on the third row. So this is what's referred to as a jagged array because they're mismatched. If I treated this as tabular data, it wouldn't work out well. But that's a powerful mechanism that we can use inside of Java. OK, so let's take a look at that. So notice all I'm doing to create a multidimensional literal is I'm just creating array literals, and I'm separating them by commas. Now I use 
formatting to make this much more readable, right? I'm not putting this all in the same line of code because that would make it very complicated to parse this with my human eyes. It's not necessary to do this, but it's for readability. Okay, so let's go and recompile this and see how it changes. Here I have my length of my array, it, of my outer array is now three, right? In fact, let's let's do this. Let's make it four just for argument's sake. Let's put another one up here that has the name uh, Okay, we'll compile and we will run. So our outer array now has four. Four array of strings is held inside of there. That first array has a length of one. And it's at, at index zero, zero, right? So we're gonna use the outer indexer and the inner indexer to actually access the string value that is in Dan. After we're done accessing, uh, accessing all the values of this for loop, we will then jump to the outer for loop where the I increments to one. So now we can say that the length of the array of the next array is going to be four. That, I'm sorry, that's this right here. In fact, let me pull this out. Let's make this more readable instead of printing that out inside the for loop. Ah. Okay, perfect. Let's clear this. Trying to clean up the logic here. Okay, so the length of my outer array is four. At name zero is going to be this array. That array is a length of one at index zero, and then index zero of that inner array will be the value of Danny, which is this one right here. Then, since I'm done iterating through that array, I'm done with the inner for loop, and then move back to my outer for loop, where I increment the index value of i from zero to one. So then I use that index value of one to index into names and say, I'm now gonna look at this array. Now let's look at the difference. The data type is the same. This represents a string array. This represents a string array. Notice the memory location is different. This is the memory location of the array that holds Danny. This is the memory location of the array that holds Ted, Alex, Joe. The length of the array at that memory address is three. The value at array of the string array at index one and of index zero into that array is 10. So again, I use the double indexer. So at index one, index zero is 10. And again, that's like saying, this is the index zero, this is index one. And then we, we go by columns. So that'd be Ted, Alex, Joe. Zero, Ted, one, Alex, two, Joe. All of these are part of the same array that's at index one in my outer array. Then when I'm done that, I'm done that for loop, I increment my index value of I to two. And now I look at this whole different string array that's held in memory. I can inspect it and see, oh, it's got a length of two. I can then use a nested for loop, an inner for loop to create that indexer J started at zero. And so at index value of zero is Elsa, at index value of uh, one with J is Tim. When I'm done that, I exit out the inner for loop, I increment my I to be three to look at the final string array. I examine that and say, hey, that's got a length of one. I index at index three with I, index zero with J, and I get access to Henry. So does everyone kind of understand how multidimensional arrays work? And so what's really crazy about multidimensional arrays is I'm not just limited to an array of arrays, I can have an array of array of array of arrays, or an array of an array of array of array of array of blah, 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 like a 4D arrays, 5D arrays, 60 arrays. I can just keep nesting arrays because the idea of dimensionality there is just an array that points to another array that could potentially point to another array. But it always will resolve back down to some fundamental value. You can't just have containers that hold containers that hold like containers that don't end up holding something at the end. 
But the important thing is, in order to find your way to a value, you have to index in using those indexer numbers for each box notation that it, it gets nested deep into memory space. Excellent. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, if there was a fifth inner array that was uh, an empty string would be zero, what would happen? Would it skip the, no. So technically an empty string is still a valid string literal. It just doesn't have any characters uh, stored inside of it. So I think what you might be asking is if we had an empty array like this, would that be valid, right? Where it doesn't have anything. I don't even know. I've, I don't know if I've ever tried to create, oh Lord. Didn't mean to hit that. I don't know if I've ever tried to create a uh, uh, an array literal with nothing in it. I don't think it'll let you do that. We'll see. Maybe it will. I, mean, I I can honestly say I've never tried. Well, it didn't didn't crash. And yeah, look at this. It's valid Java code. It's a length of array zero, and we skip it because there's no elements inside of there. But we can index in. We see that's the location in memory. So yeah, we can even just create a uh, empty array using a set of curly braces. But the problem is it's a length of zero, so you can't add anything to it. It's weird that they allow you to create an array with length zero, right? Because it doesn't even have an index zero term. Weird. <laughs> a good question though. It actually made me try something that I haven't tried before. Okay, let's move on then. So there's no questions regarding that. Well, I kind of want to take some time to illustrate this one other multidimensional array example to show how we create an empty array. So we saw how to use a array, a 2D array literal to make an array. So let's do this. Let's clear this. Let's do a, um, uh, let me create a, what is this? Multidim2.java. Let's jump here and let's paste this into here. Okay, so here I have multi sim two. I'm going to go ahead and create my main method. Now, I wanna show this in one of two ways. The first is when I go and declare my array, I'm gonna create a two dimensional integer array or an array of array of int. I'm gonna give it the name int rr. And then I'm gonna assign it using, instead of the array literal list, I'm gonna go ahead and use the new keyword. Now, when we did this, notice it looks pretty similar to how we've done this before, where we use the data type, we use the box notation. Inside the box notation, we have to declare the length of it. But for a two-dimensional array, we only are mandatorily have to set the array that is in the outer array. We don't have to set a value that's in the inner array here. Why do you think that's the case? Why don't I have to do something like uh, this, for instance, or this, or whatever, whatever number, when I create this outer array? Well, the rationale is that when I first declare my array here, what I'm doing is I got to create a contiguous block of, uh, I got to store, I got to reserve a contiguous block of addressable space that holds five values. What are the values I'm holding? Because that's going to indicate to me what size I got to give to the JVM so it knows how to reserve that space for me. Well, this outer array is holding a collection of inner array objects, right? What's the size of an inner array object? Well, it's the size of a memory location, right? Does that make sense? So we know what the memory location is. It's not holding, that's the big thing to remember with this concept of multidimensional arrays. It's not holding the values themselves nested inside of an array. It's holding a memory location to some other place in memory. So it doesn't matter if the memory, that if the int array holds a hundred elements or if it holds one element, the size of it's the same because the memory address is the same. 
the memory address to some other location of memory, whether it ends up holding a single value or it ends up holding 100,000 values is gonna be the same size with the memory address. It's like the same concept with housing addresses, right? The same size of a house address for a shack and a mansion in terms of the address is the same, right? Now, when you go to that location, then you see the volume difference between the two. So that's why we only have to declare the outer array here because it knows, okay, I'm gonna hold memory locations for up to five memory locations. And then inside of there, we can create new arrays at index zero that holds, again, we'll use jagged arrays. This one will hold six elements. This will hold two elements. Then I can index into an element, let's say inside of index uh, zero in my outer array, index three in my inner array, and actually assign that five. Then just create a quick for loop that prints out the value of my arrays, and then a for loop that prints out the value of the value that are inside those arrays. Let's quickly look at this. Multi dim two. Let me make sure I save. There we go. So what we see here is I have on this for loop, I'm printing out, hey, it has actually a total of um, five arrays. I have a memory address for this first array because we assigned it here on line four. I have a memory address, notice that's saying an integer array at this location, an integer array at this location at index one. But since I declared five and have only assigned two of them, the other three spaces are left null. There's no reference to any array there. So I can hold up to five integer arrays. I've only set two of them. For the ones that are set, if I iterate through them to actually extract the values, the value of this one here of at array index zero is going to be where I set my five, right? So at line seven, where I did int array, int array at index zero. So it's this one here that can hold six elements. And then at index three, so at index, uh, so element four, right? Or in the um, third position of offset, I will now have the value five. And the default value on an integer array, if we don't set it as zero. And then after that, look what I'm getting. I'm getting some exceptions. We'll talk about what the null pointer exceptions are. Uh, in a moment, but since I don't have a place in memory, if I try to print this out, I actually, my error, my code crashes, right? I can't get anything past this first array because, well, I can, I can do the second array here, but then when I get to this array that's null, well, I can't dereference into a null array. And so that's what's crashing my code. So, so here, the null pointer exception cannot read the array length between here and here because it's null. Excellent. So before I end today's lecture, is there any is there any questions about this code about creating new arrays without the initializer list? How I can create the outer array first, then I can create the inner array. The one last thing I want to add is if I do know that it's tabular data, so the numbers of rows and columns are the same, instead of instead of declaring just the outer array, I can also do something like this. And this would create an outer array of five integer arrays, and each of those inner arrays would then be also declared as holding five elements. And so if I just add that five there and compile my code and then run that notice now, all of those are valid. So here I now have five valid integer arrays and the indexing position in all of those are valid for without my code crashing, where I can then illustrate, I can index into the outer array zero, one, two, three, and four, and each of those inner arrays zero, one, two, three, four and have effectively uh, 16 or so different addressable spaces. Okay, does anyone have any questions about uh, these concepts? Excellent. Well, we will continue talking about arrays. Uh, today's Thursday, so I guess next Tuesday. Excellent, but I think this is it with multi-dimensional arrays. If you, when you start on your homework five, 
we, we use a multi-dimensional array to model our maze game, right? To model the positions of, in fact, your zombie game would do well to be modeled with a multi-dimensional array because your zombie game is effectively tabular data with equal amounts of rows and columns. So you'll get a chance to actually see that in homework five. Okay. Uh-huh. 